Are we ready? Yep. Can everybody hear me? Great. Well, thank y'all for hanging in today. Uh, it's, I've got a lot out of this uh, conference so far, and we've got a lot of great guests. I want to thank our hostesses again, and uh, we're great, great venues, and I hope you guys get to check out all the, the great art and fun stuff around here. Uh, so I'm Chris Steyer. I'm president of TAM. I'm the C president and CEO of the Dr. Pepper Museum Free Enterprise Institute. And I've been involved with fundraising my whole career. I mean, one, one of my first positions was an executive director. So, you know, sometimes you don't know what you're doing, but you learn. So, uh, you know, you can always learn and glean great information from all these folks. So we have a panel of very esteemed experts and have all had great levels of success in their fields and worked with different institutions. So there's a lot of experience up here and you guys have met some of them, but we are on Facebook live. So there's people watching us. So, you know, that's what the computer in front of us is for. So we'll have audience questions. So uh, just quick introductions because this is about an hour long session. Um, we want to get to the meat of everything. We have Carl Hamm, Alexander Haas here with us. Uh, great presentation yesterday. Uh, Christina Cavalier, uh, one of our hosts from uh, Perot Museum, which is where we are right now. Uh, we have Billy Fong, Paper City, uh, helped coordinate the conference, and this was kind of his brainchild. And we have Rosa Langley from the Dallas Contemporary, where we were yesterday. So I'll kick it off. Uh, for a small staff, no staff beginner, what are the best resources to get me started in fundraising? And I'm going to pitch this to Billy right off the bat to get us going. <laughs> Well, we can talk about three hours on this topic, I'm sure, but I always say one of the best ways is to create a network for yourself. And that's the whole reason for a conference or program like this. Um, I don't know how many times in my past that I, because we all don't know everything, but we're lucky and fortunate to have colleagues in the field who are willing to provide information. That's something else. This is not, we're not working for a big tech company. Um, and they're not corporate secrets. So make sure that you've gotten everybody's contact information on this right because it's so, so important. Um, there's a, a conference, I don't know if you guys have talked about it up until now, but the Art Museum Development Association. And there's a wonderful listserv through that. And I know I've learned so much from the questions that pop through. But so first off, I would say create a network of people that you can reach out to for questions. But um, the second thing to do is and I might be shot for saying this, but rely on your board. Um, I think it's so important and so key to have an engaged board. And just start from the beginning. Let's say that you're going into a new job, make sure that you meet with every board member individually. Make sure you understand the bylaws of the board. What are their giving requirements so nobody's taken off guard? And then, you know, find some people, your, your advocates, your champions within the board to figure out what you can do to, if you're in a difficult financial situation, to make yourself a little more firm. Um, but before you start talking about any kind of big growth plans, make sure that you have complete buy-in. But so I'd say creating a network is the number one way. Um, working with an engaged board or trying to create an engaged board. And then of course, taking opportunities like this, where that you go out and learn more and more. I know we did a, a session two years ago in Fort Worth on uh, donor advised months, and I am far from an authority on that topic, but I learned so much that day. So those are kind of my three of my uh, suggestions. Well, and these guys will add as we ask questions, and I always say it's easier to walk through an open door than a closed door. So that's it's very important that your board is involved. Um, so my next question, uh, what current donor giving trends are you seeing? Are you seeing traditional cash donations or are donors changing how they give? And I'm going to pitch this one to Carl. I'm sure everybody might have a comment or two on this one. I think most people are still giving uh, cash donations. One of the um, laws that uh, has been around for a couple of years, but was recently um, extended, was the opportunity for people uh, to give a uh, rollover from their IRA. And you find people, uh, is it, uh, you all can remind me, is it, it's 65, right? When you're able to. 70 plus. 70 plus. The, um, the idea is that uh, um, you can, uh, rather than take a distribution, actually roll over the, the uh, uh, funds directly to the 
nonprofit and uh, had the tax benefit from doing that. Um, so that's one way that is that is different. You know, um, in this uh, stock market environment, it's still a, a great um, tool that people can transfer uh, appreciated stock directly and take the tax benefit from that. And I think you see that really among your more savvy and sophisticated owners. Certainly, um, for our museums, you have a lot of money managers involved. People who, who really understand these these things, um, but especially the IRA rollover um, is, I think, something that uh, even in the um, um, smaller towns and rural parts of Texas, you have a lot of people who have their retirement accounts, and I think that's probably a um, very valuable opportunity for you. Um, it's as easy as going onto the internet and spending five minutes, and you're going to learn all about. Um, it's very straightforward. Let's see, those I think are the two tools that I might suggest that are different than just a, a straight cash donation. And of course, if you're in uh, any sort of capital campaign, you know, you'll want to structure multi-year agreements to get the larger gift. Um, um, but uh, no, those are a few things I might suggest. You guys have anything to add? Um, not anything in terms of financial instruments necessarily, but one thing that we think a lot about and have started, and I'm sure all of you are as well, um, here at the Pro Museum is just shift in mentality for giving and looking at that, um, particularly as we, you know, in Dallas, we have a lot of um, really generous families and, you know, there's going to be a transfer of wealth that happens. So I know a lot of institutions here are thinking about that, a lot of institutions across the country. And so I think we have seen the, the way the younger generation um, gives and makes giving choices is really different. So I think that could impact future trends in financial instruments for giving, but certainly in the way that you begin to cultivate and steward um, those members of families or those donors now. So a lot of young patron programs, of course, people have been doing that, but really thinking about how to launch those and how to make them meaningful and, um, you know, not profitable, but to where you're not just thinking a lot of investment in and then possibly not getting the return that you need to. I actually had one more that I've noticed in the last couple of years. I've seen so many boards become fixated on earned income. And because um, in a lot of ways, I think that that means they don't have to raise money if the organization <laughs> is earning money. Um, so I saw one organization here, I can't name the name in Dallas in particular, but they are working on a campaign um, to build a new um, building to create a mixed use space for education programs, um, for community access, but also for event runs, for weddings. Um, and it's easy to get people to contribute towards something that they know will be self-sustaining and perhaps even raise or, or earn even more income for the museum in the long run. One thing that I thought of after that is um, in uh, the past year or so, there's been a shift in the IRS ruling for donor advised funds, you know, really for the longest uh, uh, since donor advised funds became a really popular tool and the person could not use or, or couldn't make a pledge payment a personal pledge payment for a campaign gift through their donor advised fund it was considered sort of a, um, a, a abuse of the privilege of the donor advised fund there's been a shift in the ruling in the last year or so which i think is going to have a, a dramatic effect on uh, campaign pledge payments um, um, previously to that, a uh, person couldn't make a multi-year commitment uh, because the donor advised fund, the actual um, money, you know, had been transferred to a third party. Um, but now uh, people were able to do that. So I think that's actually a great thing. I was uh, uh, really concerned that it would have a chilling effect on campaigns when, you know, previously you couldn't make a, a payment through a donor advised fund. But that's another thing I might mention. It was a very intentional question and it was personal to me because the last capital campaign that I ran, 85% uh, of our donors were stock or IRA dollars. So you can find a lot with that because there's something about checking account money versus all that money that's just been sitting in stock for 40 years. It's still money, it's the same thing, but it, it's just an interesting thing that, that I model a lot of my fundraising on that because it's successful and it's an easy ask. Uh, so next question, what is the number one most common misperception about fundraising? And I'm gonna let 
Eh, Rosa is going to get that one. <laughs> they were not prepped before, so. I think that uh, people who are not in our profession tend to think that fundraising is easy if you live in a place that has lots of wealthy people. And I, I wonder if all of you hear this, those of you that live in big cities, um, as you may have heard from sort of statistical information, DFW is a very philanthropic place. Um, but that doesn't mean that people want to give to you. <laughs> and so, um, so my organization, for example, is very, very specific. It's only contemporary art, and it's a non-collecting contemporary art institution, and we serve specific um, groups of people. Uh, we have educational programs, but our main program is our exhibitions. Um, so that's very different from a science museum demographic or a Holocaust museum demographic, et cetera, or even very different from the Dallas Museum of Art. So we have to be a matchmaker and find those donors within that ecosystem that really care about what it is that we do. And as we all know, it is challenging. So I think that's a big uh, misconception that's out there. We just throw parties and uh, ask people for money and you know, all the things that people Job think, Lamborghinis. you know, yeah, it's, a, it's completely opposite of what uh, people think. Okay, since Carl brought it up, uh, parties. <laughs> uh, parties are not the best way to raise money. Um, again and again and again, I've heard that too many times where somebody comes on board uh, for your organization and says, well, I'm willing to, you know, chair a gala or a fundraiser. That is, that is a no-win situation at this point. Um, the expense to revenue ratios are climbing to exorbitant numbers. Uh, always keep in mind, try to strive to 32%, 33%, but I'm seeing organizations at 45, 50, and then all of a sudden you're like, why are we throwing this party if half the money is going towards putting the party together? So keep that in mind with the whole party scenario. Which we all love good parties, so. <laughs> I also add a sort of on that topic, um, there's also a misconception, even among sophisticated, intelligent donors, that the mega donors in town are going to be the best prospects. So people always tell me that Dallas Contemporary has to go after Toyota, for example, or whatever, <laughs> and just because they're in the DFW area. But they might not want to support contemporary art. And so um, that's something that's a, a teaching moment for, for your donors or your board of actually the best prospects for us are people who are interested. <laughs> and engaged for sure. And I think Billy's point too about the parties, that's a great way to burn out a volunteer base. Mm -hmm. Coming from organizations that done galas every year. And we, we did well, but you can just see it, the who steps up are usually your closest supporters and they're already giving to you and they work hard and sometimes feel underappreciated and everybody's tired. And it takes six months to plan and all that fun stuff. So Christina, I haven't forgotten about you. Uh, in your experience, what is the biggest mistake that development professionals tend to make when working with individual donors and benefactors. Personal stories would be great. Sure. So that's what everybody wants. <laughs> uh, lack of stewardship. Um, I'm, I have not personal stories of my own lack of stewardship, but I have lived through the results of lack of stewardship. And um, it is the thing that does fall by the wayside. We are all stretched for time. We are all stretched for resources. None of us have a big enough team. No matter how big a team may seem, it is never big enough. Um, and that is the first thing that just goes away. Um, and so that is something that I think is the number one thing that can differentiate you as we heard in the presentation today. Um, and it's also the number one thing that can really upset a donor. People are people and they are investing not just their money but their heart and soul in whatever your mission is and if you're not acknowledging that and acknowledging it in a really meaningful way they are not going to give to you again and they are certainly not going to give to you in a major way again um, so i think that it's very obvious but i do think that to me is the thing that i have seen as the number one mistake um, with individual 
giving, um, you know, because it is so personal at a company and you need to steward them as well. And that's incredibly important for retaining those gifts, but it's a little bit less personal. Um, in that case, your stewardship is really more about their, you know, return on investment as opposed to the impact that they've made in, in showing gratitude. Um, so I think it's a, it's really not that difficult to do. Um, I think there are ways to kind of segment your donor base and do it in an efficient manner that can still seem what seem somewhat personal. And then of course you elevate your top donors to the top and make that really personal. Um, and I really believe it needs to be more than, you know, an acknowledgement after they make a gift. My team has heard me say a million times that is the most basic form of stewardship. Um, I really think our acknowledgements should go out 48 hours after we get a gift. That doesn't always happen, but um, you know, that's the formal acknowledgement. We do calls and things, of course. Um, and then an annual report. I mean, those are really basic, so you should be doing that for generally everyone. Um, but then think about how you can elevate it because it can differentiate you. Um, so I'm not sure if anyone else has anything to add, but I feel very passionately about it. <laughs> I think I think a danger zone, um, particularly in smaller organizations, is um, what is that expression? Don't let the um, good the great be the enemy of the good. Um, when you get so caught up in the inertia of your year and all the things that you have to manage, that you don't spend those time going after those few huge gifts that are really going to make a difference for you because you don't have time. Because if you don't get a lot of things done, but you get you know a hundred thousand dollar gift or something like that, that's just going to move the needle way forward. So um, even if you're really busy, it's important to obviously spend time in that area. And I'm actually going to commend Rose on something um, for so many, many things. But in my new world of having to go to events constantly, um, after your gala last year, you sent me an email with a picture of me at the event. And once again, it can just be those simple little touchdowns, as Christiane pointed out. A picture saying, look how great you looked last night. It was wonderful seeing you. It's just those little, little touch points that mean so, so much to people. And to what um, Christina had said, um, development operations. It's yes. the, it's, you know, what we talked about yesterday, the most important thing to make sure that things don't slip through the cracks and that, you know, 48 hours is a great goal. Um, and uh, donors know this. If, you know, you don't want them to forget that they've actually made the gift before they actually get the um, uh, acknowledgement letter. So it's super, really important. Perfect. So uh, moving right along. Uh, we, we touched on this a little throughout the conference, but in your personal experience or what, what is the best follow-up method in your opinion for lapsed memberships? And I'm gonna pitch this one to Billy. So memberships was how I rose through the ranks of the museum profession. I uh, was very fortunate. I started out in the mid nineties working at LAC, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. And our membership because of one exhibition uh, this Van Gogh show went from 60,000 to 150,000 members. Um, so a massive amount of people, and that's, that's how I got my whole feet in the water with the museum profession. I think it's so, so important to do an active renewal campaign. Um, I had this conversation with an organization in Houston that just didn't quite grasp what membership was about. And um, I said, well, how often are you sending renewals? And they said, well, we don't really. <laughs> <laughs> and in their minds, they just expected to automatically renew, that they would know that Christine had joined our organization last year. She should remember, I'm sure it's in her calendar, to write us another check. No, people need to be asked. Um, and once again, it depends on the size of your organization. When I was at the High Museum, my last membership gig, we had around 55,000 members, but we had a really active renewal campaign. We would do six letters. Um, and once again, these were not all the same six letters. Every letter had a different letter signer. Every letter had a different kind of theme to it about one might be your membership dollars support our education programs. One might mean the benefits you garner from being a member at the High Museum of Art. Um, you know, email if you don't have the money for a letter writing campaign, because it's true, you've got to have stationery and postage and everything else. Email works well too, but in this new world where everybody's got so many emails, letters mean something. So, you know, keep that in mind. It's important to do, and if you can't do it based on somebody's 12 months a year, then do a renewal campaign at least once or twice a year. Maybe the first, uh, you know, January 1st, and then in June 1st. So, do you have a I question? I have a question. Um, and I don't know if it picks up my voice. 
Um, so I'm at the Houston Museum of Natural Science, which is located in the Texas Medical Center, the largest healthcare complex in the world. <laughs> and so we feel like we're part of that community and part of that neighborhood. And my question goes to the, the old business adage of doing well by doing good. Um, so we're coming up on a membership promotion. Um, and I pitched the idea of a buy a membership and we will donate a membership to the Houston Museum of Natural Science to a Texas Medical Center family. Um, it allows people to create memories while they're undergoing this difficult process. Um, and we're going to be relying on um, patient services um, at hospitals or child life departments at pediatric hospitals to identify those recipients. Um, do you have any, ex I mean, do you have any experience, anybody on this sort of um, endeavor? Because we just want people to come to the museum. I actually love that idea of buying a membership and the organization will give a membership away. Um, at the High Museum, we did something um, somewhat similar. We gave memberships to teachers because we always felt that people wanted to support their school system, the education system. We thought if we could get teachers in here, that we could we'd get their classes in there. But we found that that worked at higher levels of membership not our entry points so the people who are giving this will be at a higher level. exactly a so i think level. exactly you want to focus on people who are going to give you 250 dollars a year and say if you give us that amount we will also pass along a membership to a teacher to a healthcare professional the only thing that i would caution you the and then you say that a healthcare professional to me means dollar signs and, and i would think well they have enough money no it's a patient family oh okay and okay. most of them are medicaid families oh wonderful so people in need people in need we haven't done that specifically here, but we have, um, what we have done that's similar is we have a program that provides $1 admission to families on any form of government assistance. Um, we originally launched that only in the summer, um, but now it's moved thanks to funding year round. We have done an appeal to our members um, to ask them to increase either their membership or add an additional contribution to afford other families the opportunity to come. And it was really successful and it actually helped us find some new donors um, bubbled to the top through that. So I think um, it, was, it, it was successful as a way for us to increase revenue. So I would, I would encourage you to think about how do you elevate the level to Billy's point of, at which you would ask for that or ask them to give an additional contribution. Um, and it doesn't have to be a lot, but I would think you want to kind of bump your incremental a little bit from people because then again, you'll see people bubble to the top. Um, and then I would also imagine to make your thinking this that you could go to your partners who have the people who will benefit and maybe that's a new list of prospects for you. Um, to kind of think about it's marrying something that they are those donors to that those sorts of institutions might be passionate about with your mission I'm sure you're thinking of that. But yeah, that's that's kind of the goal. Yeah And one last thing that I've always for 20 years I've, I've utilized this idea I love enlisting volunteers with your organization to place thank you calls mm -hmm. um, Volunteers are always so squirrely about asking for money <laughs> <laughs> but a hundred percent of them are willing to place a call to thank somebody for having given money. And we would always do that at my larger organizations where we enlist people and say, here's a hundred names of somebody who just renewed their membership. And the truth is nine times out of 10, they were getting a voicemail. So it was just easy to just say, hi, I'm Christina Cavalier calling from the Perot Museum of Nature and Science. Thank you for your, and that means so much for somebody to get a phone call. And then once again, if it's a volunteer who says, I'm Christina Cavalier, a volunteer here, that means that somebody else cares so passionately about the organization that they volunteer their time and they're calling you to thank you for their support. So. Thanks, good answers. Uh, I think it always helps to have a fantastic program and great exhibits too that you can promote. Timing is kind of everything. And I think with your former places, you know, you had some great programs to build around. That's what we're all about. So it makes our job easier. So, Carl. Okay. <laughs> What is the most useful tool for building, what's the most useful tool for building ongoing relationships with donors in your opinion? Personal contact. One of the great things about museums is that we have events throughout the year. We have exhibition openings, we have um, you know, parties and 
um, fundraisers and generally unlike um, you know some organizations like let's say a hospital where you really never see a lot of the people unless they're on the board or really involved we have this opportunity to actually be with people um, I think that um, at every exhibition opening or opportunity to have people especially in the museum um, rather than stand in the corner and talk to one or two people it's really important to be very visible in public and, and uh, really work the room and, and make those relationships. Um, and I think that over the course of years, uh, you have the opportunity to build relationships with dozens of people, or, you know, you know, it, it grows over, over time and you look back and, and say, wow, I know, I know 100 people. I know if you, if you stop and think about it, when you look at the list of, you know, your upper level members or the people who are um, really involved, um, it, it becomes, that you um, think of them as friends and that they think of you as friends. Um, I think that uh, because we get so busy with the day-to-day -day of just the operational aspect of um, managing uh, a development shop or um, especially if you're a one-person shop, all the just ongoing work, but you have to be intentional um, about in, uh, making contacts with people even though you might they might not if they miss an exhibition opening, you might not see them for six months. So you really have to, um, in a way of describing it, have a moves management system for yourself so that you're not um, letting a year go by when you've only seen somebody one or two times. So that's it. I mean, it's personal contact. I mean, it's the way of developing the relationship. And, you know, in today's world, um, well, um, texting and, um, you know, with some people you develop a enough of a personal relationship that you're actually texting back and forth or having some sort of email chatter back and forth. Um, that's totally different. I was thinking about, um, you know, over the 18 years of museums or 30 years that I had back, back then, there was no such thing as really, uh, email was not really a common thing um, 30 years ago. And now we have this opportunity to, to have really personal relationships just through that sort of um, communications tool, social media, when you're friends with, with some of your daughters. So, um, but nothing beats personal contact. Actually, I was gonna elaborate a little on that. I think one opportunity that is so ideal is if you get a chance to travel with your donors. Um, I know I, when I did in art museums, we would all do donor trips. I always see Rosa when I'm in Miami for Art Basel. Um, but just to share with you, my father, who lives in a retirement community, he is a donor because they are building a memory care facility. And the head of development at his retirement community brought him and four other people up to Tennessee to see an organization that had recently built one that they wanted to sort of emulate. And that's such a great way to inspire people is when you get that time. And to Carl's point, I mean, I have to say when I've traveled with donors, if you get a three hour layover, it's great. I mean, they, they, they are hostage to you, you know? <laughs> you know, when you're on a bus stuck in traffic, going from, you know, one place to another, that, you know, that's a great ideal opportunity to chat with somebody. And, you know, and that's how relationships and friendships are built as well, so. I just uh, also want to mention, in addition to your direct relationship with your donors, it can also be nice, the extent to which they create networks with each other. Um, and I'm sure this happens on almost all of your boards, but I think that when multiple board members are friends with each other, and in one case, we have this big friend group that uh, have pretty much all become donors to the museum, uh, it helps the longevity of the relationship because it just feels like a part of their life in, in many areas donating to your organization. And one thing that I would just comment on is that the, the importance of authenticity and the relationship that you have with, with donors. I mean, obviously some of your donors are in a completely different social class or, you know, have a whole different life and um, um, worldview than you do. But, um, you know, I think that um, some fundraisers, you know, give the profession a bad name because they're slick and they have this agenda and they're, you know, uh, you know always coming across as trying to get something from the donor or really having a, um, you know, um, that type of, of um, personality. Um, and I found that um, really when you are just yourself and, and uh, develop um, you know, an authentic relationship, 
it, um, you can find, you know, 10, 20, 30 year relationships that come from it that even though you might not talk to people um, over the course of time, still you might, um, 15 years later, um, consider each other friends. And, um, and when you have that connection or opportunity to have that connection, um, it's still there. So um, that would be one more piece. I highly recommend taking trips with your donors. Uh, I was just being in Dallas. I remembered a donor, a trip that we went with the don on with the donor and a friend. There were antique car collectors, so we went to the car auction, and it was just a great, you know. And they had been donors before, but they became really big donors after. But it's just getting to know them and know what they want to do. And and a lot of the donors that I've had from other organizations I've worked with, I'm still in contact with them. Yeah, we still talk or text, and so it's it's all about relationships. So I think that's really important. So, uh, and these are all questions that we got from the membership. I'm not just making these up as I go along, although it may seem like that. But uh, we didn't really plan for this, but we, that's why we have experts up here because they know things, and so we can just fire things at them. So my next question I have is: My board members seem reluctant to take on the role of fundraising, shying away from direct asks but not specifically empowering me to take the, make the request either. How can I help them see this as a critical need for our institutional institution's survival? And so I'm gonna pitch that one to It's your turn, Rosa. <laughs> I think that, uh, that part of that question relates to uh, kind of a staff-centered idea versus a donor-centered idea in that, um, they do know the need for the most part. If they're a board member, they know that you have need. So I don't think getting them motivated is a matter of telling them there's a need for the most part. Um, I think that the two things that really do activate people, one are being really excited. So if you have a program that you can really pitch to them that they can tell their friends about, in our case, it'd be an upcoming exhibition, um, for you, it might be like a community program or, or an exhibition at your museum um, that's in the future that they can really galvanize themselves and other people around. And number two is, is their own personal ownership related to that project. So if they, if you give them a title, if they're an ambassador or a chair or, or they have some kind of a relationship where they have a formal feeling of leadership, um, that can really activate people too um, in a different way to say, I am signing up for this specific thing. I don't need to feel 365 days a year that I have to fundraise for you, but for this project, for this period of time, I'm gonna reach out to my network and make a difference. Just gonna add something oh, to that, sorry. Well, I think sometimes too, when board members are hesitate, hesitant to fundraise, it's because they're not comfortable doing it. And I mean, fundraising is not for everyone. Um, so what I have done in the cases where I've had board members who obviously know the need, they know that we need more funding than from only our board members, um, is ask if, if perhaps they're hesitant to make an ask, is would they make an introduction? Or could I talk with them about my pitch? Or could I have lunch with them and just, and maybe you know that they know the person that you want to make an ask of really well. And so perhaps what you do is you engage them in the ask, especially if they seem hesitant to make the ask, and just saying, well, you know, here's what I know about this person. What do you know about them? What would be really compelling? Here's my thoughts, and letting them weigh in, because then it brings them closer to the situation, and it gets them really comfortable with the strategy part of making an ask, um, so that maybe next time when you go back to them, they may then be willing to actually go to the lunch with you. Um, I've also said to board members, both here and other organizations, um, you know, I'll do the hard work, please just, you know, ask them to pick up the phone when we call or ask them to pick up the phone when the CEO calls. Um, so I think there's other ways to engage them if the, the factor maybe really is fear. I mean, everyone's not comfortable doing what we do. I think that's another common misconception about fundraisers is it's scary. <laughs> it's really fun. <laughs> I think a, a, a great donor meeting is where you would um, almost, this would be almost a picture-perfect situation where you would have the, the board member be willing to set up the meeting or go on the call, and then they can, can be the chatty, friendly person with their peer. Um, but then when it comes to the part of actually talking about 
the, the, the campaign or, the, or whatever you're going to talk about in terms of the museum's programs, um, they sort of kick it to you. Because we eat, sleep, live, breathe this every day. We know all the stats. We know all the, you know, things about it that, you know, they don't keep up with, you know, on a, they just sort of generally know they're supporting the museum. Um, but then you can sort of be the expert and talk about the program and the need and, uh, you know, give the, give the heavy duty part. And then um, if they're just willing to say, well, you know, I think this is important and I gave and I hope that you'll, you'll join us. Um, that's really all they have to do. It's really, um, uh, not, I think they perceive that you're going to make them do everything and go out and do it on their own and be you know, sort of hanging out, with them, especially with a friend, and they don't want to be rejected. Um, but, the, you know, going along with the caller, um, in the, the case of especially large, you know, so it's usually the director that goes on the, the call with the, with the board member and, and just prepping them and making sure that uh, uh, they're comfortable before, you know, with the facts and details before they go. But, uh, no, they, they, they shouldn't be out there. In fact, you kind of don't want them out there on their own. <laughs> you don't know what the conversation is going to be. You know, what deal you know, what they'll call. <laughs> 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 you have to, to somebody you know, have to there to keep things. You know, so you can actually write down or, or keep in, in the notes um, you know, what transpired. Um, and actually, it's important, too, that the, the, the gift that is often made between two peers directly does not result in a deeper relationship with the organization. Mm -hmm. It results in a quid pro quo between these two friends. And so um, that doesn't necessarily result in a long-term relationship with the, with the museum either. So, uh, no, that's um, we, have, we have another question from the audience, but I think that's a couple. And, and I think uh, one thing to mention with that, in a small town, sometimes, you know, I, I've seen this a lot in my career, for in smaller towns and small, smaller organizations, you know, friends going to ask a friend for a donation. Well, that friend's going to come around and ask them. They may have their own cause, so you got to make sure that that person is aligned with your cause. So I've seen that happen. And you want to drive the train. You want to be there. You know what deal? You want to know what deal was going to be made. So I will pitch it to him and then get back to you since you got to ask one. And uh, I'll let Alex take this. Yes, we'd like your ideas on reading material to look at or a website. Experts like yourselves, perhaps, on fundraising, uh, philanthropy, um, building a strong nonprofit, those areas. I was actually, that, that was an idea that came to me when Carl was talking, because I look at Carl as such an expert in this, this arena, and having worked with Tam for many, many years, I think Tam could be an excellent resource Alex to maybe the development committee put together, you know, four great books. Because I remember when I was in the trenches years ago working with boards, there are those little tiny books that can be read in like an hour, that like the 10, you know, 10 tips to the great ask. Um, and I'm sure that there's a million and one websites out there now too. So you're not asking your board members to read Dostoevsky, you know, Tolstoy. They're like 50 pages. Our but attention yes. spans are long enough for that. Exactly. But I think that that would be a great thing if Tam could, you know, put together a list of five books five websites um, for you guys to all like share with your board members to show how easy it is. Because there's, there's still those books out there. It's been a while oh, since yeah. I bought them. <laughs> <laughs> you know everything already. <laughs> you know, I was going to say, say this yesterday, and I, I'm glad that we got the opportunity. If I was going to recommend one book, just one book that you should go read, it's called Designs for Fundraising. It's by um, Harold J. Seymour. It was written in the 60s. And you know, back then, fundraising was not a, a you know, profession like it is now. It was really hospitals and universities. It was really a, um, a much different uh, operation. Mm -hmm. But, but it, you talk about a guru. This, this book is really, you'll be reading along. And some of the language is, uh, you know, language has changed. And uh, you'll def you know, definitely uh, note that it is not gender uh, neutral, you know, it's very, you know, he, he does this and he does that. It's very, very much of a different era. However, I think that the, you know, the, the basic ideas that he talks about are totally relevant 50 years later that they're, they're, you know, some things haven't changed. The nature of volunteers and how they, how some percentage of them 
work really hard and some of them don't do anything. That hasn't changed. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, he gets into that. He talks about um, the case and why the story and what you're actually uh, talking about is so vitally important. So Designs for Fundraising, it's, um, it went out of print, but it's come back in print. It used to be that it was $150 to get a copy. But you can it's find it on Amazon. Yeah, it's currently so, $35 on Amazon. That deal. <laughs> $35. So it, it, it's, it's, uh, because they found that it's really that good. So that's my one tip. <laughs> I would, in general, say focusing on books that relate to individual giving, uh, because some of the fundraising sort of textbook uh, like books that have been published that relate to. Uh, you know, email marketing, grant proposals, they can be a little bit antiquated if uh, they were produced a long time ago. I was revisiting this book, uh, I believe it was called Successful Fundraising for Arts Organizations. That had a lot of nice reference points, but I had originally bought it when I was in grad school, which was <laughs> 10 years ago. And um, there was literally a CD-ROM in the book. <laughs> careful with email, you know, so, um, you know, so some of those things don't apply. Um, as far as a book that comes to mind on the theme of what Billy was talking about, there's a book called Asking, a 59-minute guide, um, and it's a very short book, and you can read it in an hour or two, and what I love about it is, number one, it has a lot of best practices that every single person that engages in fundraising can use, whether it's an assistant or a board member or an executive director. Uh, but number two, it gets you fired up to go fundraise. It, it's a lighthearted book. It's funny and um, makes you excited about your job. Um, I have two small children, so I don't read a ton, but um, I do have a couple things I like. There's um, a, a blog called Know Your Own Bone, perhaps y'all are familiar, so I find that really fascinating, Colleen Dylan Schneider. Um, it's just a lot of good data that you can, I mean, I think the context of that is important. Um, I actually learned about it from some colleagues here at the museum. And then the other thing I do that's not really related to necessarily professional development, but I think it's related, really related to your work, and it depends upon your city and market, but um, we have a lot of great resources here of like society publications, like the papers, um, yeah. but others as well. And so I try to keep up to date on that because I think it's really helpful for me to look and see other places that my donors and board members are involved and what they're doing. It gives me insights into what they're passionate about um, and just what else is going on in the philanthropic community. I mean, I think you should always be doing kind of basically a competitive scan and analysis because if you know you're launching a campaign or you know you need to make a big major gift ask of someone, you probably need to know if they've just made a large commitment somewhere um, because you may want to reshuffle your order of your ask and maybe they go later um, in a different phase. Um, so I, that's kind of a thing that I try to do every single day. Um, I get some kind of email updates and try to keep up to date on that. So we had a question from the audience. Another one. Um, so that was all lighthearted and wonderful. Now I'm going to go dark. <laughs> um, um, so um, Houston has been noted as the most diverse city in the United States. And uh, at least in the for-profit world, the C-suite um, has become more diverse. And many of the organizations that I've worked at and that my friends in fundraising have worked at, that has not been reflected um, on the board. Um, I think intellectually, a lot of our presidents and our board members do that, but it still remains this very, somebody said it up here, good boy, good old boy network. Um, and we have just an amazing resource of wonderful people of all backgrounds that could fill our board seats and recommendations go up who are members or who are donors and nothing happens. How do you handle that? Does anybody in here have an uh, inclusivity statement for their organization? Is any diversity in it? Nobody? We not, for board, so. not for the board. Not for the board. So I think that's very important. But uh, who want, do you? Everybody wants to. Good question. Good question. 
So this is obviously a common problem for everyone. Um, and it's something that is, from a funding perspective, funders are hugely interested, let alone it's just the right thing to do. And if we really do want to be representative of the communities we serve, it's imperative. Um, so I think the first thing that is really necessary and that has really helped us, and look, we're not doing, you know, we're on our way here, right? So we also do not have a diverse board, but it is a very clear focus for us. Um, and it is something that's really important to our CEO. So I think it really has to be important to your kind of staff leadership, right? Um, and then they can help drive that through to your board. Um, one of the things that we're really excited um, that the Pro Museum is participating in is the um, New Facing Change Initiative, if you've heard of that with the American Alliance of Museums. So really the whole goal of that initiative is to have a series of workshops and trainings over a couple of years in which you then have a clear strategic plan of how you are going to diversify your board. Now the lead time on that obviously is long, but it does help you kind of do it Right, and so um, I think it's also indicative of our commitment to doing that. Um, we also really kind of dissected and created a very special um, task force of our board to look at our governance structure um, because we wanted to understand, okay, if we're all committed to this, why isn't it happening? And in our case, part of that was really about our bylaws. I mean, you know, you have board terms and you have term limits. And so you do become a little bit, in our case, kind of limited about how you can get new members on. So that was one of the challenges. And so we had to remove that hurdle um, first. So those are some things that we do, but I think kind of push it forward is you really have to have um, your leadership be a champion um, and then find some board leaderships who can also be champions and help um, arm them with talking points or, you know, anecdotes or whatever. And I think it's always helpful too to say, um, for example, the city of Dallas, we get a large grant from them. And one of the things we have to report on is our board diversity. And there are points that we lose and have lost and will until we can kind of cycle through things um, on our funding because of that. Um, luckily, it's not, you know, monumental, but so that also is a good talking point to share, I think, is to help educate your, your board and your peers or whomever and say, you know, this is a big deal and here's why it's a big deal. Not just because it's the right thing to do, but, you know, sometimes you do have to go with, here's how this impacts the bottom line. Right. And then the mass of other things that are on everyone's plates. Yeah, that was an awesome answer, and I'm actually envious that you have, like, this huge board prospect pool that's diverse, <laughs> um, you know, um, so then maybe in that case, what Christina said as far as, like, investigating what the other aspects are at play, um, we still uh, have yet to make improvements on this uh, at our museum, but in terms of my personal sort of career experience as far as donor diversity, not just board diversity, my uh, secret trick is critical mass. Uh, so just like the foundations that were up here don't wanna be the only ones sticking their neck out, whatever demographic that you're going after, a lot of people don't wanna be the only one uh, representing their entire community. So um, at the museum that I worked with, um, in California, the Huntington Library, the fundraising director had to create a whole new constituency of donors for the Chinese garden. Um, and, and that was like a massive donor fundraising initiative. Um, but she did this very strategically, which would take a long time to tell that whole case study. But um, this whole group of people came in as, as donors, which um, then subsequently attracted more. Um, at Dallas Contemporary, we have a young professional group called the Contemporaries that really struggled for years. And then my former uh, development associate brought in this big group of her friends. And all of a sudden there was this starting point, there was this foundational network of these young people that then attracted uh, more people. And then a year or two later, I didn't even know who everybody was who was showing up to these events, which was amazing. But you have to have that initial push point for any kind of diversity factor that you're talking about, whether it's age or obviously, um, you know, ethnic or racial um, or whatever it is, uh, in income level, um, language, uh, you know, bilingual attendees, whatever, um, you know, getting that core group uh, will, will get the ball rolling for you. Well, first off, I, I think it's so important that we're all discussing equity, diversity, and inclusion. That's something that TAM really focused on in the last couple of years. And the Houston Endowment is an organization that strongly believes in that. So you could even go to them for their support and even say, you know, could you 
hooks up with a consultant that can talk to the board and show them the strategic long-term reasoning behind having an inclusivity plan for the organization. But back to the fundraising side, I was fascinated, it was about six or seven years ago, a friend of mine from the MFA in Boston asked me to take part in a Harvard study on giving within the Chinese community, since I'm Chinese. So it's, it's important to keep in mind that every community might give differently. Um, and it really made me begin to realize the way I was brought up that my parents always supported the performing arts. They really weren't taking me to museums. So, you know, you kind of have to look at things in a thoughtful manner that your, your ways of asking your typical white donor might be different than how you should, you know, talk to a Hispanic donor or an Asian donor. Um, so, so definitely, definitely that. And another trend I'm seeing as well is if you are struggling with diversity on your board, you can look at some of the other things that aren't always classified as diversity. You know, maybe we're moving towards a world where you can say that I actually have, you know, X number of LGBTQ people on my board. You know, that doesn't check off a certain box, but you know, we've got this kind of religious diversity on my board. There's certain types of diversity that aren't really being focused on at this point, but that's diversity. <laughs> And that shows that and we my, are on my board. It's some people live in River Oaks and some people live in Tanglewood. That's the diversity. That's a common problem. And what you're going to need to do is, it's to echo in their points. These decisions are not made by you. It's made by the head of your board, and then it'll trickle down from there. I think one organization that I'm so in awe of that I will point out here in Dallas is the Dallas Symphony Orchestra. They have an in the AT and T Performing Arts Center as well. They have an incredibly diverse board. But these were all very strategic decisions they made five, six, seven years ago towards creating that kind of that kind of structure and community and organization. I think we're beginning to see some of the major foundations, um, you know, really forcing the issue and, and withholding funding for organizations that don't um, at least make significant strides towards diversifying their boards. Obviously, the city, and, um, you know, you've read about uh, New York City in the um, funding. Um, there, you know, you know, ultimately is going to be cut or withheld from organizations. I think that um, it's going to take probably, truthfully, it's probably going to take more of that from a larger group of uh, donors. Um, because right now, I mean, to have your city funding cut by a certain amount is not really going to have a huge impact. Um, but I think about, uh, I was thinking earlier when you were talking about that, if I tell my son, if you don't make A's and B's, you can't play basketball this semester. Well, guess what? You know, there's a, a huge incentive for him to actually um, bring things up to a certain level. Um, um, and so I think it's going to take more of that, probably. And what I would sort of close with on that is um, this uh, next generation of donors, the millennials and others that are coming up that, are, that have a much different worldview and a much different um, um, uh, emphasis on on diversity and inclusion, um, equity and inclusion. I think um, you're going to see uh, not only them becoming much more uh, hands-on and engaged with uh, the impact of what you're doing, but actually this is probably going to become an issue there, and um, you're going to see them actually looking at the board structure and uh, the actual um, diversity culture of, of an institution. So I think it's kind of going to have to be a some ways, maybe a forced um, uh, thing that people are going to respond to rather than just, oh, it's a nice thing to do. What's the right thing to do, the right thing? I think that's a good way to end. Uh, and, and I'll say that the last three foundation grants that I've applied for have asked for my statement of inclusivity, and they've asked for who what the board looks like, and they've asked for a charter board of tenants over the past year. So that will impact your funding. It, you know, and plus, it's the right thing to do. So, well, I think, thank, thank you all. And would y'all give these guys a round of applause? <laughs> Thanks.